Good morning or good evening, depending on where you are. My name is Sanchita Saxena and I'm the Executive Director of the Institute for South Asia Studies. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you all today to today's, uh, today's event with Professor Shomik Bondavadai, who will be speaking about Tagore through the wars. I'd like to welcome Professor Prana Bardhan, who is Professor of the Graduate School at the Department of Economics at UC Berkeley, who will introduce Professor Bondavadai and today's event. Um, as Sanchita said, people being in different time zones, there's no um, <laughs> point of either saying good morning or good evening. Uh, in, um, in the speaker's case, it's, it's late night. So let me just say greetings from Berkeley. And uh, before I introduce the speaker, uh, let me say a few words about the Tagore program, of which this is a part. This is a program, uh, the Tagore uh, Literature, Culture, Philosophy uh, program. Uh, it's a, a kind of a unique program anywhere in, in the United States that Berkeley has started. And uh, it is going on for, the, for the nearly a year. Uh, we, in fact, this lecture to, uh, today is the third one. Um, the first one was given by uh, Dipesh Chakraborty uh, from University of Chicago. Uh, the, and of course, in February before lockdown, and at that time there was some performance, music, performance including um, the staging of the play Tashir Desh, and then the lockdown came, and in this semester, the first, uh, the second speaker in the series was uh, Fakrul Alam, who's a professor from Dhaka University. And, uh, and today, Shamik Bandabadhai would be the third speaker. And then uh, very soon the semester will end. So next, sem beginning of next semester, we are going to have a concentrated program um, of about two weeks. So this is all to celebrate the life and legacy of uh, Rabindranath Tagore, which I think is particularly appropriate at this time all over the world. In the, just to give you a preview of what's coming in the February program, uh, there will be more lectures, uh, including lecture from R. Shivakumar uh, in art, uh, Tagore and art, a lecture by uh, uh, Shukanto Choudhury on literature, lecture by uh, Orindam Chakraborty on philosophy and aesthetics, and a few other lectures. And there will be three panels. One panel on women in Tagore's literature and art, where the panelists would be Tonika Sharkar, Shupriya Choudhury, and Rushuti Sen. There will be another panel on uh, Tagore and science. The panelists would be Bikas Sina, Partho Ghosh, and Sushant Dotto Gupta. A panel, a third panel on nationalism, where the panelists would be Ashish Nandi and uh, Sudipta Kobiraj. And then there will be also uh, uh, some music and performance, performance including, by the way, a staging of the play Daggor. So that's a quite an eventful program uh, that's going on and will and coming in February. Uh, but today's event is also a, a, a very uh, important one, uh, where we have uh, Shomik Bandhapadhyay. So let me now say a few words on Shamik, my very good friend. Sh Shamik Bandhapadhyay is one of the most leading figures in Kolkata's world of art culture, and culture. In fact, some of you may not know that some of the leading personalities in culture in Kolkata, let me give you the example, Shottuji Trai. When Shottuji Trai uh, was to give any serious interview, 
he would first think of Shomik. Um, similarly, uh, with um, uh, film director Mrinal Sen, similarly with, um, uh, with the writer Maharshita Devi. Um, Shamik, uh, as I in is in in the field of culture, particularly uh, in literature, in films, uh, films, and in theatre. He was, I think, uh, one uh, once the vice chairman of the National School of Drama in Delhi. Um, in academia, his most recent appointment was as a Rabindranath Tagore. National Fellow in Jawaharlal Nehru University. Uh, this was most recent, but even before he had off, he had been off and on for many years. He has been a, has been teaching at Jawaharlal Nehru uh, University. In 2014, I, I, if I remember right, he was the ICCR chair at the uh, Department of Theater Studies in the Free University of Berlin. Let me, uh, I'm not going to take much more time. If you want to know more about his uh, bio data, it's already with you. You can, you can read that there. Let me just say, and on a personal note, that I have known Shomik um, for many years now. When I think about the years, uh, it, it reminds me how ancient both I and Shomik are. From my college days in Presidency College, Kolkata, Shomik was in English literature, I was in economics. Uh, but also, it's very important to, for me to state, both Shomik and I often represented the college in debates. And I think among many debaters in the college, he and I were the only ones who could debate both in English and in Bangla if Shomik remembers that. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to ask Shomik uh, to speak. But before that, uh, one piece mm -hmm. of advice for the audience that as he speaks, um, if you have questions, uh, go to the Q&A Q &A box, not the chat box, Q&A box, put down your questions. Uh, we will come back to those questions after um, uh, later. Okay, without further ado, let me invite Shomik Bandupadhyay to the Zoom. <coughs> Shomik. Uh, hello. Uh, halfway uh, through Naibedda, a collection of poems that Tagore published in 1901, a collection that celebrated divinity. In fact, all the poems halfway up were devoted to a dedication, surrender to God, a series of spiritual, mystical poems steeped in reverence to the Almighty. And suddenly, in the middle of that, he bursts into a very unlikely piece of poetry. A nameless poem, a poem without a title, barely numbered 64. The sun of the century sets in a mass of blooded clouds in a wild, deadly cacophony of clashing weaponry, celebrating a carnival of hatred, civilization, the merciless dragon, has raised its hood in a trice, its hidden fangs loaded with mortal venom. Self-interest confronts self-interest. Greed battles greed. Barbarity, sheathed in respectability, rises from its mire in the vicious churning of time. Devoid of all shame, the egregious crime of nationalism, 
seeks to sweep religion away in a flood of force. The poets scream in panic, barking away like a pack of dogs squabbling for the share of smoldering flesh. It's followed by another poem. The more self-interest gorges itself, the more it burns with craving and oh. treats the universe. The more self-interest gorges itself, the more it burns with craving and treats the universe as a food to be devoured with no compunction. Now, all this was my translation, but something that often happens with the Gaulle is that when he translates his poems, he adds things to them. I think there's a right to that. He uses the other language, he uses English, and the resources of that language to carry his message. So the next few lines I'll read in his translation, which builds upon the Bangla and gives it a more, I would say, ferocious charge and licking it, crunching it, and swallowing it. It swells and swells till in the midst of its unholy feast descends the sudden shaft of heaven, piercing its heart of its grossness. And then I come back to my translation. As nationalism runs in pursuit of death, carrying shiploads of self-interest irrevocably towards the hidden rocks. In fact, if you try to build images out of the words, some of you would remember Goya's fabulous image of Satan devouring his son. Satan, the spirit of time. Now, this was in 1901, 14 years before the First World War. But the words seem to be prophetic of the First World War. And already in 1901, even before the war is there in its awful presence, Tagore is reading the war ahead and reading the war in terms of the drive of capital and its ruthless plunder all over the world that brings the war around. As the war started, this reading of the war becomes stronger and stronger. And in the process, he slowly withdraws himself from the mainstream nationalist freedom movement in the country. Because in the nationalism, which seems to be the slogan, which seems to be the only rallying point of the movement for independence, he can see the lurking danger of where this nationalism, where this crude standardization, the uniformitarianism of the differences, the diversities, not just in terms of languages or cultures, but also classes. Also in the geopolitics of the country, people living in the cities, living in the villages, living near the forests, living inside, within the forests, the tribals. All these brought into a single national category. The politics involved in that, the standardization involved in that, that terrified Tagore, and he was slowly withdrawing himself from the national movement itself. In 1901 itself, he starts his school in Shantaniketan, starting from the roots. Let's give the children a chance to relate to nature and 
turn away from the deadly politics of nationalism. The only major act, participatory act, in the freedom movement that he would participate in and involve himself in would be in 1913, uh, when there is the terrible massacre over the martial law in Punjab at Jalil Wallabagh. And even then, when the politicians were more worried about having a smooth transition, handing over of power from the colonial masters. So they were still concerned at the negotiation tables to go try his best to build up a protest against the brutal killing of people in Punjab. And there was no response to that till he renounced his knighthood a month later. That was his last major political act in the freedom movement, and a political act which he took himself, the decision was his, while the rest of the so-called movement was not concerned about it. The fear of war, the haunting fear of war, that carried on, and even as the war started, it came to another phase his tour in 1916 17, even as the war raged, his series of talks on nationalism. And in his text, Nationalism, published in 1917, he identifies the war with the national machinery of commerce and politics. In his reading of history, he calls India an India of no nations. He says, her thrones were not a concern. They passed over her head like clouds, now tinged with purple gorgeousness, now black with the thread of thunder, Often they brought devastations in the wake, but they were like catastrophes of nature whose traces are soon forgotten, a mere drift over the surface of life. It is only when the British colonial system came to rule over India, it was the nation of the West driving its tentacles of machinery deep down into the soil. And in nationalism, which was a tool of capitalism, and also maybe the progenitor of capitalism at the same time, that is what kills, destroys India's culture, India's diverse traditions. And in retaliation, in resistance, India also tries to consolidate itself into a nation. He reads that the question of the conflict between the spirit of the West and the nation of the West. Writing in the middle of World War I, he identifies, I quote to Gore, a pack of predatory creatures that must have its victims. With all its heart, it cannot bear to see its hunting grounds converted into cultivated fields. In fact, these nations are fighting among themselves for the extension of the victims and the reserve forests. Power manifest in capitalism, national pride, and the aggressive 
stance. This has been going on even before the war for years, till it comes to the war and describes the world war as a war of retribution. The nation has thriven long upon mutilated humanity. Men, the fairest creations of God, came out of the national manufactory in huge numbers as war-making and money-making puppets, ludicrously vain of the pitiful perfection of mechanism. Human society grew more and more into a marionette of politicians, soldiers, manufacturers, and bureaucrats, pulled by wire arrangements of wonderful efficiency. But the apotheosis of selfishness can never make its interminable breed of hatred and greed, fear and hypocrisy, suspicion and tyranny, an end in themselves. This nation may grow on to an unimaginable corpulence, not of a living body, but of steel and steel and office buildings, till its deformity can contain no longer its ugly voluminousness, till it begins to crack and gape, breathe gas and fire in gasps, and its death rattles sound in the cannon roars. In this war, the death throes of the nation have commenced. In the war years, as the Caribbean talks to the United States and to Japan, he became unpopular. The reputation, the standing that he had achieved with his Nobel Prize in 1913 was already being denied. And there had been crowds when he arrived in Japan, but when he bitterly attacked Japanese aggression of China, the crowds turned against him. And when he left Japan, there were few to bid him farewell at the harbor. He faced this, and even as he faced this, the face of war, the reality of the First World War, came back to him again and again in various forms. On 1st August 1920, de Gaulle, then touring Britain, received a letter from Susan Arwen, mother of the poet Wilfred Arwen, who wrote, It is nearly two years ago that my dear eldest son went out to war for the last time. And the day he said goodbye to me, we were looking together across to the sun-glorified sea, looking toward France, yet breaking hearts, when he, my poet son, said those wonderful words of yours. When I go from hence, let this be my parting word that what I have seen is unsurpassable. When his pocketbook came back to me, I find these words written in his dear writing with your name beneath. Would it be asking too much of you to tell me what book I should find the poem in? Arwen joined the army in October 1915, while his letters to his mother from the front survive. Strict censorship did not allow the truth to be told, and there is nothing in the correspondence about the terrible experience that Arwen had to go through in the first four months of 1917, when he had to remain in a badly shelled forward position for days and look at the scattered, dismembered fragments of a fellow officer's body, slowly rotting and disintegrating and stinking. The experience drove him to neurasthenia and hospitalization. After a year of home duty, 
He returned to France in September 1918. That is when mother and son shared the lines from Tagore. He was machine gun to death, his body blown to pieces. Early morning on 4th November 1918, at the age of 25. At noon, on 11th November, ironically, when the armistice bells had been pealing in Thanksgiving in Shrewsbury, the telegram reached his parents' house. By the time Tagore received the letter from Mrs. Arwen, the death of Arwen had grown into a potent modern myth spelling the doom of the poet, artist, lover of life, wit, I'm quoting from Arwen, a howitzer, just 70 or 80 yards away, firing over the top every minute or so. In the platoon on my left, the sentries over the dugout blown down to nothing, unquote. One of his own sentries, quote again, blown down, and I'm afraid, blinded, unquote. Arwen could write to his mother on 4th February, 1917, quote, I was kept warm by the ardor of life within me. I forgot hunger in the hunger for life, the intensity for love reached me and kept me living, unquote, in an endless history of war. For a couple of generations at least, the cruel irony of the death of the poet, so obsessively in love with the world, and the communication of the death after peace had been declared, making mockery of the peace that is symbolic resonance. The First World War shook people off the moorings, in a way that we cannot imagine now, when wars have become so common and regular, and as the German poet Ingeborg Bachmann put it in bitter despair, wars are no longer declared, they carry on. The First World War had its impact, and in this impact lies the seeds of the Bishop Harati project, the university, the all-embracing university, where nature, not the romantic, Wordsworthy nature, dripping from all over, but a nature that has to be understood in its own terms, in its coexistent relationship with human life, with human existence, the value of life. That became so central to the Bishop Harit experiment that God concentrated in the project, a school, a university, cultures, experiences, nature, humanity, merging, mixing, coalescing. It became a mission for him and the project You'd go about lecturing all over the world, raising funds the hard way. At one time, you'd even get into a bitter misunderstanding with his close friend, Mahatma Gandhi, who stopped him, or asked to stop him, begging. And Tagore said he took pride in begging, if it was begging for a different culture. And even as he struggled with Bishop Bharati, getting older and older, getting weaker and weaker, and still traveling throughout the world, carrying the same message, the message of the nationalism, the message of peace, his tirade against nationalism, his warnings against nationalism, and the distortion of civilization that seemed to haunt him all the time. And yet, the Second World War came along. In 1937, 
he was disturbed by the civil war in Spain. And soon after, Guernica was bombed, barely eight months after the bombing of Guernica. On Christmas Day, 1937, Tagore wrote yet another poem, a very different poem from the kind of poems normally Tagore's readers and devotees associate with them, a bitter, angry poem in my translation. The day my consciousness was released from the cave of dissolution, he drew me to the edge of a volcano, spouting the flames of hell, all in a tumult of wonderment, spelling terrible calamity. Its burning smoke, roaring deep disdain of humanity, its ominous breathing, shaking the earth, staining the air with a hue of black. I saw the self-destructive, idiotic frenzy of the time with the filthy mockery of corruption all over its body. On one hand, arrogant inhumanity, the shameless vaunt of madness. On the other, the faltering footsteps of cowardice clasping to its chest the treasured holdings of a miser. With the moment's prowl of a scared animal, giving way to safe and silent acquiescence, all the masters of states with mature authority, hold back within the tight lips all orders and decisions in doubts and fears, while the monstrous birds rush into the troubled skies, flight after flight from the banks of the river of death. Vultures craving for human flesh, the mechanical wings and loud clamor desecrating the sky. O oh, judge, seated on the throne of eternal time, give me strength. Bring the voice of thunder to my threat so that I can condemn this havoc that kills women and children, a condemnation that will ring forever in the very breathing of a shameful memory, even when the stifled, terrorized, shackled age will be lost in silence in the ashes of its funereal fire. The violence of Tagore's rage at the creeping progress of the war, the very direct reference to the fighter planes, the aerial bombings that began in World War I and continued through the Spanish War to enormous dimensions in the Second World War, is registered in the sound pattern, the power of the words and the sounds in the original poem in Bangla, which sounds so different from all his earlier poems. In a story, Dongsho, Destruction, written on 6th March 1941, barely five months before his death, to go root of a father and a daughter, nurturing a garden a little distance away from Paris and sharing a life of perfect contentment, taking pride in the home. I quote to go, costly home, not made of a king's jewels, but of the love that the two of them shared and hence nowhere else to be found, unquote till a German bomb landed on it. Quote, the only touch of kindness that it had was that the girl Camille did not live to see the destruction, Unquote. The story closes with these lines. Everyone was stunned as they measured the might of civilization. The shell from the long distance machine gun had covered 25 miles. This is what one calls the progress of time. In yet another country, yet another time, the might of civilization has been tested, its evidence visible only in the dust and nothing else. That was in China, which had to fight with two big civilized nations. 
it was doomed to lose anyway. For civilization has achieved exemplary mastery in the art of wounding and killing. They taught it wonderful art, product of the meditation of masters over so many generations, was lost forever, clawed and lacerated by civilization within a little time. I'd gone to Pekin on a visit and saw it with my own eyes. I had nothing more to add. The story is followed by a poem that begins with an evocation of those times when we considered life sacred and the humankind to be human. The thought, quote, in the West appeared civilization. Incidentally, in his Bangla poem, he uses the word civilization in its English form, doesn't translate it. In the West appeared civilization, planting thorns all the way and grinding its truth. We had thought we knew what civilization was. Now we find that desecrated and humiliated, decked in machine and might, civilization is bent on repressing mankind. The two world wars left their powerful impact and has struggled in the interwar years to create a different source of civilization, a center of civilization in Shantanathetan. Initially, before the wars when he had started Shantanathetan, he had been using the words tapoban, literally a group for meditation, ashrama, and ashrama vidyalaya for the Shantanathetan in the 30s. He became conscious of the possible misreadings that lurked behind all those terms. He redefined the Poban in the 1933 essay, reading into the concept, the convergence of nature in the form of a sense of the country's universal nature, Vishwa Prakriti, as experienced in life in the heart of the woods. And culture in the form of the purest and highest culture of the country accessible in life. He set out his goal. The ideal has to be accomplished in reality as far as possible. There is no question of an imitation of the Tapoban in its externalities, for that would be anachronistic, hence invalid. I would like to insert its essential truth into the modern way of life. It is doubts about the state and character of civilization that God would also come up against the ugly face of science. Science completely controlled by the state, particularly a militaristic war mongering state. In his Rakta Parabi Red Oleanders, a play that he wrote 10 times between 1923 and 1926, in the aftermath of the First World War, and even as fascism had raised its ugly head in Italy. The king at the center of the play is actually a man of science, totally cut off from the power system, but the power system uses him as a cog. And only at the end of the play, for the first time, he breaks open the doors of his laboratory to which he had been confined in trying to go to the roots of power, power at its most intrinsic, power at its most secret and dangerous. The mode of negotiation with nature still that Tagore envisages in the Shantaniketan project is one that works through observation and examination. The two terms, the two basic tools of science to which it comes back again and again with the necessary writer, quote, above all, it should bring joy to the soul. 
And in this quest of joy, he searches for roots, sources, treasures in all the cultures, local, indigenous, folk, and foreign, alien, from all over the world. Shantiniketan becomes a school for culture. And in a note of self-censure, even as another war comes before him and threatens him, he addresses himself, rise poet from the seats you have had for long, in the courtyard of fame with its incessant buzz, bring to a close your adoration of the goddess, the public, craving for flattery with her offering to words. And with the merchandise of voices, the term uses, receding from him, he meets a withdrawal into silence and he recognizes Chitrabhanu, literally, the son of images, the world of painting. And he virtually stops writing poetry in the last few years of his life. But still, one of the last poems he wrote in 1937 is a reversal of the poem with which Wilfred Darwin faced death in the First World War. On Christmas Day, 1937, he writes another testamentary poem, like the 1913 poem that Wilfred Darwin adored. And this is in a completely different tone. While the dragons fill the universe with a venomous breath, gentle words of peace will sound a futile mockery. Hence, before I take leave, let me call on those who are preparing themselves in the homes for the battle with the demons. The striking difference in attitude and tone evident in the two poems both in the form of testamentary last words, is a measure of the impact of the wars in between on to court. Thank you, Shamik. That was a splendid lecture. I'm supposed to uh, converse with you now on some aspects of your lecture before we open the discussion to others, um, you have very rightly emphasized uh, of the various distortions, uh, distortions of um, nationalism. Uh, the, the one that is to do with mili militarism. Um, and Sorry, um, sorry. Um, what I want to take you, extend this a little bit to the interwar period. Sorry, my phone is. Uh, the interwar period, uh, he also went into other distortionary uh, aspects of uh, nationalism, not just the militarism that you have emphasized in your talk, but I think you very briefly in passing talked about the other distortions which have to do with the power of the state, power of capitalism, and things like that. And I want to bring you out to that aspect, not just the militarism aspect, which you emphasized in your talk. So for example, you referred to the play Rock the Korobi, where it's not the militarism as such, but it's more the power of capitalism, 
the abuse of science and things like that, right? Yes. Um, uh, I was not going uh, too far into that because uh, in, in the initial announcements, you said that there would be a whole session on nationalism sure. later on in your series. <laughs> nice. So, uh, because in nationalism, in its text nationalism, and uh, something that is also very important is that when he talks of this uh, industrial system generating, building up to a power, and a power which is, takes the form of aggressive imperialism, colonization, loot and plunder. Along with that, even as the identity of the nation state is overemphasized, standardized, presented, given a form of formidable power, even as that process happens, De Gaulle goes so insightfully into how it weakens the fabric of the mother state also. When you launch this whole paraphernalia of power and authority and impose censorship of all forms, it generates a fascism within the country also its secret services, its whole machinery of power within the country. And their nationalism becomes one of its facades. You put nationalism before yourself and you say that for the sake of the nation, you, you must have sedition laws. You must force people speak frankly and honestly and criticize the state. As he puts it in nationalism at one point where he doesn't use the word fascism, of course, in 19, uh, 16, 17, when he writes his nationalism uh, lectures, but he says the slavery that it gives a rise to unconsciously drains its own love of freedom dry, the helplessness which it weighs down its world of victims, exerts its force of gravitation every moment upon the power that creates it. Whenever power removes or checks from its path to make its career easy, it triumphantly rides into its ultimate crash of death. Its moral break becomes slacker every day without its knowing it and its slippery path of ease becomes its path of doom. And he goes on to talk of the secret service, the surveillance within the state. The state becomes a fascist state in this process, where capitalism is instrumental in creating a fascist state, inevitably. And what is the secret service? But the nation's underground trade in kidnapping, murder, and treachery, and all the ugly crimes bred in the depth of rottenness. Because each nation has its own history of thieving and lies and broken faith. Therefore, there can only flourish international suspicion and jealousy and international moral shame becomes anemic to a degree of ludicrousness. So nationalism, power, capitalism, they make their way into one another and they contribute to the system of a fascist state at the end of it. And this is a phenomenon in which we are seeing all over the world from the United States to India. Great. Let me um, then draw you out on another aspect, which is uh, the then, did Tagore think about um, 
state can be somewhat more benevolent if you could move away from capitalism, move away from the machine. So for example, if you go to 1930, when he went to Soviet Union, his letters from Russia, when did it come out? I think in 1930 or 31. Early 1930s. 30. The letters were written in 1930, but they came out in 31. Right, later. But in that, it's very interesting that he praises the state for the education system. He goes on and on about how good the education system in Soviet Union was. But I think in some places, he object, he's objecting to the authoritarianism of the state. So in a sense, even when you go beyond capitalism, the power of the state is a distortionary effect. Would you agree with yes. that? Yes, very much. And he talks about that as early as, uh, as nationalism. There also he comes to this point that power, when power uh, becomes the character of the state, then the state loses. It's natural humanity, an initiative. And again and again, he comes back to this in nationalism, particularly, where he sees that as long as the human mind is free to work outside the machine and the human mind can use the machine, can employ the machine, not become part of the machinery, not driven by the machinery. He plays on that distinction again right. and again in nationalism. In fact, I'm reminded of two earlier pieces by him. One is, of course, in the 1920s, I think around 1922, the play Muktodhara. Yes. In Muktodhara, it's the machine. In fact, right. uh, the, the hero, mm. Ovijit, loses mm. his life in fighting the machine, I think. And mm. then, uh, yes. And much earlier than that, I think in the first decade of the 20th century, I don't remember the exact date, there is a long essay he wrote called Shodeshi Shomaj. Yes. Also, mm. it's the state. That is the problem. Mm. In fact, he's trying to show that you should be less dependent on the state. Uh, it's society that's much more important, which then he comes back in 1930s, mm. early 1930s, in his Harvard lecture, where it's society is much more important than the state in it to him. So in a sense, it is repeated in, in different parts of his life. Again, uh, not just capitalism, but also state versus society. Would you agree to that? Yes. And he talks again and again uh, in his prose, in his uh, poetry, also in Noibedo, in some of the later uh, poems, as I said, uh, halfway through, he suddenly bursts into the modern reality from the larger uh, spiritual uh, spirit of the earlier poems of Nobeto. Even there, he goes back again and again to the point that the community, the human mass, the mind of the people freely working, critiquing, challenging one another, that freedom has to be ensured. But the moment you wrap it all up together into a system, into a structure, into uh, the mechanism of power, which is his, his term for the state, virtually. He doesn't use the word Russia, but he again and again comes back to the word uh, power, Shokti. And this has to be humanized. The human independence, the human freedom, it can't be pure reason. It has to be also the consciousness, the sensibility, the mind of a community, of a whole group of people, not the concentrated system of a state. That is an obsession with him. And uh, I believe throughout the, uh, even before the war, because Noibadu is 1901, and the Shantaniketan experiment 
the new body of articles and essays he wrote about Vishwabharati from that time and into the 20s, rethinking Shantaniketan, Vishwabharati, again and again in those terms, to keep the freedom of human sensibility operative continuously, seamlessly, and never fall victim to the authority of the singular state. Thank you, Shamik. I, do, I shouldn't monopolize you. Uh, let me now uh, give the floor to uh, Shanchita, uh, who is going to conduct the discussion from now on, on the question and answer session from the floor, the Zoom floor, as it were. So uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pranav. Pranav. Thank you, uh, Professor Bandabhadeh, for your wonderful lecture. Um, so right now, I don't see any questions in the Q&A box yet. Um, so, but I would like to encourage all the attendees to please ask questions and type it in the Q&A um, Q box. And if, uh, Pranav, if you'd like to continue your conversation, um, if you have a few more questions. Sure, sure. I was going to, I was going to continue with where we stopped essentially on the issue of the state. Tagore's uh, view on the state. You know, often the Bengalis think that there is a big difference between the thinking of Mahatma Gandhi and Tagore. But on the issue, on their various um, issues on which uh, Mahatma Gandhi and Tagore defer deferred openly, and they have written to each other about things on which they differ. But I often think on the issue of the state, they had very similar, similar opinions. Um, if in the, going back to that es long essay that I told you, Shadeshi Shamaj, which I think it was written in the early part of the 20th century, 1903 or four, I forget the exact date. But the same decade, uh, Gandhi wrote Hind Swaraj. Hind Swaraj. Uh, that's 1909, I think. Hmm. Uh, now, Hind Swaraj, Gandhi openly says, describes himself as an enlightened anarchist. Um, so, in a sense, he is quite anti openly anti state. Um, so it's very interesting that in the same decade, Tagore in Swadeshi Shamaj is talking about uh, society is more important than the state and asking his country, um, country uh, people to be not so deep, to be dependent on the state. And then um, in the 1920s, the various things that you referred to, the state comes back again and again, also in 1930s. So in a sense, that's where uh, Gandhi and Tagore, in my ju uh, judgment, come together, even though we all know there are a lot of very important differences that they had. Yeah. Uh, now, so would you, would you comment on uh, this similarity between Gandhi and Tagore? So I'm in agreement with you, but at the same time, where uh, now when we look back, uh, there were deep line differences which are now surfacing in the different historical context that uh, Gandhi's emphasis on the traditional Hinduism, that was something that the God wouldn't accept. And turning things into ritual, religion, uh, faith, and the famous essay, you know, which was a kind of uh, early retort to Gandhi almost immediately after they had come in touch and started exchanging ideas and sharing ideas, uh, which he writes in Bangla as uh, Shukti Rauhan and immediately translated himself as the call to truth. And uh, which is a sort of a reply to Gandhi where he says that We'd expected so much from Gandhi because he was the first nationalist leader who addressed the people, the larger Samaj, the larger community, 
rather than sitting at the conference table and negotiating with the colonial masters for a proper deal. Still, once he had the people responding to him and coming to him, what did he offer them? He offered them the chatta, the spinning wheel. Go to the spinning wheel and that will give you spiritual regeneration, energy, everything. Now, is this the truth? Is this the called truth? So, kind of fixating on a faith, on a cult, later on it would be the fasts. This was again a kind of turning the free flow of ideas and debates and discussions into a rigid, strict, straight direction. He questioned it right then, at, at, at virtually the first encounter, that was the first, first direct encounter between the two, in a way, after Gandhi's students had visited Shantaniket and, and everything. So that was somehow uh, deep down in Gandhi's kind of thinking, offering a common formula a way, a particular way, and rigidly sticking to it. And that is something to go went on challenging, demanding more of that flow, the freedom of thought. Yeah. I see that there are some questions coming up, so let me not, let me again uh, turn to Sanchita. Uh, Sanchita, are there some questions? I see some questions. Yes, that's so, right. So, um, with just a couple of questions from Alice Clark. So the first is, would you relate the concepts? Oh, it, oh, sorry, it looks like it's one question. Would you relate the concepts in your lecture to Tagore's essays in uh, Toward Universal Man? Uh, I think quite a number of these essays, for example, Nationalism and uh, the Crisis in Civilization, these are the two major texts on which uh, uh, I was depending. And a lot of these, are, unfortunately, the, the, uh, the, the Vishabharati texts in which uh, from post First World War to the end of the 30s, he died in 1941. Uh, he was exploring the Vishabharati context. It, it, it's unfortunate that these essays have not been translated into English yet because there is another more constructive way of uh, dealing with these questions, because he was trying to translate it into a kind of way of thinking and living in a free discipline, the culture of Bishop Harati, which is a project which uh, failed and is gone now. But as long as he was there, he was at actively involved with it and arguing it, articulating it. It's a shame that a lot of these texts have not been translated into English and do not belong to the volume towards universal man. Thank you. So I don't see any other questions at the moment. Um... If there is no other question, let me um, uh, engage um, Shomik on another extension of what we are discussing. Uh, and maybe I, will, I want to ask you whether uh, there is another area, related area, where you see any similarity uh, between Gandhi and Tagore. Um, Gandhi, of course, on the militarism aspect that you referred to, of course, Gandhi would be completely in agreement with, with Tagore. Yes. And uh, militarism, and to some extent, on their attitude to the state. Right. I'm not so sure is their attitude to science, attitude to machine. Now, 
Tagore seems to be somewhat amb ambivalent on the machine. As I mentioned before, in Muktodhara, the play, it is the machine. Uh, yes. Then in, in Rokto Korobi, it is not just the machine. It is abuse by a system. That becomes much more important, the systemic abuse. Yes. Um, of science, particularly. Science. Is, uh, is it, uh, if you see this evolution of Tagore, and then contrast that with Gandhi's attitude to machine, which of course quite negative. He was averse to machine. He was averse to uh, some aspects of science. So uh, would you have uh, comments on that? I think Tagore had a more uh, complex attitude to science and technology science and machine, if we say, in the sense that, as we know in uh, Shantaniketan, he set up, when he sets up Sriniketan, uh, the idea is that uh, at one level, Sriniketan is the part of the university. It's very much a part of what he considered the university the Vishabharati, uh, if you look at it uh, semantically, has so many meanings worked into it. Uh, Bharati, uh, drawing upon enlightenment learning in its connection with Saraswati and India. It's, it's not, it doesn't mean just, just the world and India. Bharati has also the, old, the bearings of uh, Saraswati, the Sarasvata Sadhana culture, the whole world of culture, and relating it to the world. So in Vishabharati, having these two chambers, maybe you can call them Shantaniketan and Sriniketan. And again, if you think semantically, Sri is beauty, but it has to do with craft, craft rooted to nature, and also the use of machinery, in the sense of technology, he sends his son, Rotin Thakur, to study agricultural technology. And here Rotin in the United States, in University of Illinois. Yes. And he comes back with agriculture being treated with science, with technology. So very consciously. So it, 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 it's not just an uh, adoration of nature in the Wordsworthian sense, or the touch of the ground or the earth, not just that. Science is very much part of that. But science under human control, science under a community working with science, with technology, a more humanized, human use of science. Science never turned into a system. That was a very conscious way. The, the whole Srinitan experiment, which has never been really addressed or studied, but great work has been done there in terms of uh, agricultural technology, anthropology, and uh, even social sciences, the sociology. Uh, good I, I've seen good scholarly work there also. So that was very much part of Tagore's scheme. And uh, if you look at something like uh, Rakta Karabi, Red Oleanders, uh, what I feel, and not a lot of people have noticed it, that though it is about a king, a raja, in the play itself, in the text, there is not a single point where the king has anything to do with the people who carry on the system. Not a word exchange with them anywhere. He is entirely cooped up in his laboratory. And at the end of the play, as you remember, you know the play so well, uh, from a, that uh, when the army, the state, has become active, has come on the streets to suppress the workers, to fight against the workers, to stop the demonstration, 
he says in despair, we'll have to prepare everything in advance without my knowledge. I never knew anything of this. So he has been given a kind of a false impression of power. And this is what has happened to scientists, to technologists, all over the world in history. The sense of victimhood that the nuclear scientists felt and experienced, whether it was Einstein or uh, Oppenheimer, all of these scientists, the way they felt they had been used by the state and, that, and, and where their science, their understanding, the knowledge had failed utterly under the dictates of the state. That is what Tagore brings up so powerfully. So the presence of the state, the power of the state, the value of science, the possibility of science being used as an instrument of power, this complexity, this entire range of complexity, this is something that Gandhi never addressed. So it's not a question of whether I support the machine or detest the machine, whether I take recourse to science or turn away from science. Tagore plunges himself into this entire complexity. That is what fascinates me. Right. Let me um, uh, uh, bring you out on one other issue, related issue, since you brought up Sriniketan, not just on Sriniketan. Sriniketan is where um, the rural aspects of life uh, were, were particularly emphasized. Now, this is again maybe uh, related to Gandhi and Tagore. Um, so both of them um, emphasize, both Gandhi and Tagore emphasize the rural community as the central aspect of, uh, of Indian society. Um, and here, I'd like to know if you have any views on this uh, nature of human beings between rural and urban society. I have particularly in mind, I know, what are these called? Um, I know I remember the Bengali version, the Bangla version, Manushet Dharmo, which is the religion of man, lectures in Oxford, right? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, religion of man, but right. it's to do with what people think about religion. It's, it's really the mor morality of man. Morality. Right. The ethics, more about ethics. E e ethics, ethics of ethics. It's not really religion in the usual exactly. sense. Exactly. So now, if you read that, those lectures, there's a very uh, interesting anecdote Tagore states that one day he was um, starting from Shantiniketan on, in his car um, uh, going to Kolkata. And very uh, sh short distance after Shantiniketan, the car uh, malfunctions. It actually, uh, he doesn't mention it in the lecture, but he probably, the carburetor got overheated. So it needed, water needs to be put into the carburetor. So this was the time of the uh, uh, dead of summer, and there was a drought that year. So he, the, the, the driver uh, and people in the car uh, stopped in a village, not far from Shantaniketan, and asked for water to pour into the, um, into the engine, in, into the carburetor. So people are so generous, even though there's a tremendous water scarcity in the village, they put water in there and also offered water to everybody in the car to drink. And it so happened that in this 100 miles distance between Shantaniketan and Kolkata, the car had to be stopped many times to get water. And everywhere in the villages, people without any hesitation offered water and uh, uh, in, a, in an extremely drought affected uh, uh, area and, and, and time of the year. But he says, as we were nearing Kolkata, <laughs> people were less generous. <laughs> in fact, in one place, somebody even asked for money. 
So he uses this example as the rural values of society versus the right. urban. Huh. So, and this is where I think Gandhi would have agreed with him because right. Gandhi the, so I, I was wondering if you have any views on this rural urban thing on which also they had some similarity. Yes, exactly. Quite a lot of similarity. The same respect for the village, the respect for rural life and the cultures, and an interest in it, a genuine interest in it. Right. And this, I was wondering whether this also tells you something about the urban society loses some essential humanity. Humanity is what hmm. Tagore's central uh, yes. focus on. So whether hmm. the society uh, loses some of that humanity is what with, uh, but with more and more urbanization because for both of them urbanization is also mechanization and right. standardization right and the loss of that freedom of sharing normally responding to human demands and desires right and in a sense that's where man's ethics manushya dharma yes gets uh, somewhat uh, uh, and whenever and, and whenever i try to translate to god every time i come to dharma i pause for a while because it's not religion it's never no, of religion. course not. even though never. he himself probably the, when the english version in oxford lecture he called it yes. a man yes right um but is there any i think i'm monopolizing you is there any other Shanchita? Uh, no, no, I think this conversation is wonderful. Um, uh, no, they, I don't see any other questions. So if you would like to, we still have some time. So if you'd like to continue, um, certainly you can, you can continue your conversation. I think it's, it's very interesting. Maybe Shom Shomik, since um, you are a specialist in theater along, along with many other things, could you tell us about uh, his ideas in Rabindranath's plays on, on the kind of issues that I've talked about. I've already referred to Muktadhara and Rakta Gorobi. Do you uh, see the web? Uh, no, beyond these two, of course, there is uh, Ochalatun, uh, which is again, while he was working uh, with Shantaniketan, uh, there was a fear that uh, institutionalized religion authority, power, these can take over. So some of that fear, that fear of authority, the fear of one religion taking over, all these were behind his mind when he came to write Achalatan. Right. And what is the date of Achalatan? I don't remember. I don't remember exactly. Okay. Is, it, but it is it after, very after much Rock, after Rock the Gopi? Uh, uh, yes, after Rock the Gopi. Okay. And also the other uh, text, his short play, which has been uh, widely staged in Bengal is Roti Roshi, where there is this chariot right. that, uh, ha which has to be pulled, which is heavy, and uh, the Brahmins and the rich, the caste uh, superiors, they all try to pull it and they fail, till the Shudras, the, 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 toiling classes, I wouldn't use the word working classes in the Marxist sense, but it, it, it is the toiling people, the common people, and the people of the village, of course, who come from the village. Really. And once they touch the rope, the rope softens and the rope moves. So these ideas, these ideas he was playing with in his theater uh, again and again. And uh, once again in Achalatan, uh, the school, it's a school, it's an institutionalized school at the beginning. It had started with a different idea, but those who carried on, those who took over, they changed its character into a strong institution. And in the process, the students are not allowed to leave the structure the solid, hide-bound architecture of the place and never go out to the fields. And they, 
when they get the freedom, when they get the chance, and there is this one boy who's disobedient and wouldn't follow the rules, he goes out and he meets the working people, the common people, the people who dig mines. And there's this wonderful song about how they bring out the iron from the ground. There are the songs of working in the fields. And working people, labor, the value of labor, the use of labor, and how labor is also a major factor in the making of the community. Your attitude to labor, your handling of labor, your relationship with labor, your spiritual connections with labor, they become such an important thing in Rothi Roshi and also Ochanatan. And yeah. once again, I would say that is something, again, which I, uh, I haven't found in Gandhi. That, that recognition of labor, not just the dignity of labor, but the, 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 the naturalness of labor, labor's facility with the resources available to mankind. It's labor that can handle these things and bring them into circulation and use. I see there are now question, uh, some questions. So, Sanjita. Yes. So, um, Professor Vandaba, the question from uh, Thomas, uh, Tom Rosen, who asks, please reflect on, the Tagore, on Tagore in relation to the Gandhian principles and strategies for reclaiming dignity and courage through activist action in the face of repression? Uh, that's a problem area in the sense that quite early in his connection with the nationalist movement, and both Pranab and I, we have tried to uh, speak about it in our conversations also, the shape that nationalism was taking in the national movement, in the activism of the national movement, uh, De Gaulle saw something uh, dangerous and sinister. And in a way, he was quite prophetic and insightful because in the later history of India, we have seen how nationalism also becomes a divisive force where the majoritarian class or population, they make the nation their nation, their institutionalization. They virtually institutionalize their majoritarian power into the nation. And that was happening in the activism of the nationalist movement. And Tagore withdrew from it. So Tagore never really joined the movement as such in terms of activism. So no question of a strategy or anything of the kind. And as I said, in uh, 1913, when there was this terrible uh, massacre in Punjab, a state where martial law had been declared because there was an anti-sedition bill movement. And when in violation of that, there was a meeting and the police brutally killed more than 500 people, shot them to death, and virtually surrounded them in a small area so that they couldn't escape to safety or life. After that horror, that was in April, early April, uh, when Tagore appealed to the national leadership, the freedom movement leadership, the activists, to take a position to do something about it, at that point of time, they were negotiating with the, with the British for a quick withdrawal from India or more rights to be given to uh, the nationalist parties. So they said they wouldn't like to, and, and that was Gandhi's word, in fact. He said he wouldn't like to embarrass the government. So all these things uh, created a kind of resistance and disgust in Tagore, and Tagore took his own personal position he uh, returned the knighthood with a searing letter of condemnation of the massacre. 
So in terms of activism, we really don't have any way of uh, finding out how uh, he felt about it. Rather, in uh, one of his novels, uh, The Home and the World, he criticizes uh, the activism, the nationalist activism, which again uh, made issues out of uh, problems or situations which often went against the interests of the common people. The question of a majoritarian politics, this was a fear and a quite tangible fear that kept Tagore away from activism as such. So that's, that, that is a problematic area. But Gandhi was a strategist. Gandhi took various kinds of positions in, in his activism. At any point when he uh, leads his people to a point of a kind of a civil disobedience campaign, a resistance movement, and he finds that the movement is going beyond his control, he would suddenly withdraw it. And he had that kind of a charismatic authority that if he said no, they would stop. And uh, now when we look back historically, we find that at some points, this kind of a charismatic, singular leadership could, in slightly different circumstances, even have led to a kind of a, a fascist one-man shirt. Thank you. And to go straight out of that. Thank you. Um, so I think we have one final question from Arj of Jain who asks, uh, Tagore, ha Tagore has a different idea pertaining to the nation state. And I would like the speaker to comment on that. Uh, Tagore, obviously, uh, the point that we have been trying to make, uh, opposes the concept of the nation state. He would rather have a widely secular, democratic, communitarian culture or community. Have a community and create instruments, institutions, loose, flexible enough that allows for maximum interaction and responding to the voices of the people, of the community, and keep the community as open, as general, as free, without any distinctions of class, caste, community, religion. Because these barriers are so insurmountable in India, and they have been utilized and exploited by the power brokers in different stages and different manners. So that danger was such a real danger that to keep the community open, let not there be a strong nation state structure, not the identity of a single nation at all. The diversity is fair and fine and historically weird enough. What's wrong with it? Thank you so much. Well, I think um, our, we are running out of time. So uh, Pranav, do you have any final thoughts that, or any final co questions? Okay. So I'd like to thank you again, Professor Vandabhadar, for a wonderful lecture. And um, thank, you, thank you to both of you for your discussion. You. That was very engaging and very interesting, your conversation. Um, so it was uh, wonderful to see you and thank you again. And thank you to our audience, everyone who attended. Um, so good night, everyone. And um, good morning here, I guess, or as you start your day. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you very much.